you have never failed me waiting for chance to
Father, we'll see you do it again. We stand in this place asking you to do it again this morning. The Lord, you will manifest your heart to us this morning. The Lord will come and worship you and give you praise and see burdens fall off because we are lifting up your name. We are magnifying you much bigger than anything, much bigger than any worry, much bigger than any problem, much bigger than any hardship because you are our God and you are an awesome God, a God worthy to be praised and to be exalted. Oh, speak to us this morning. Charge our hearts to have faith. Give us grace to throw away our burdens that we may walk out of this place free in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Worship leaders, you can sit. Now today, I want you to say goodbye to worry. Okay? Goodbye to worry. That's it. God put a message on my heart and I know when it's from God. No, when it's from God because when it's from God, I'm restless. Okay. Uh, it's from God. God, yes, you may not completely like okay, overcome uh, everything. Worry will come back uh, in different episodes. But uh, there are things you're going to put down today and say bye-bye to those ones and move on with uh, with your life. You know, worry attacks all of us. All of us. Pastors, uh, ministers, workers, mothers. I think it's even worse for mothers. I mean, it's, 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 it attacks all of us. I remember during COVID, I really struggled. And uh, till God spoke to me, it was so much in my subconscious that I wasn't even aware. And God told me, I will provide I will protect you and I will heal. And those three words from the Lord carried me through COVID. This thing of worry really messes up our lives. The things we have to battle and put them on the side. But you know this thing of worry and anxiety attacks all of us in different ways. The chances are uh, that uh, you regularly exercise or experience some level of worry or even anxiety. You regularly. It's a sense of um, concern. You are concerned about something, something sometimes you don't even know. Something you can't even physically touch. Something you can't uh, explain. Sometimes something that's not there. It's a sense of being disquiet. You are not quiet. You are not quiet. It's uh, like um, a car that is parked in the neutral geo and you are racing uh, the car, but you're not going anywhere. It's like, but you're not going anywhere because you are in neutral. You don't have any movements. Uh, it's like uh, you are boiling water, but never making a cup of coffee. But the water is just boiling. But you never turn around and make a cup of coffee or make tea out of it. So your life is just boiling. And for those who understand the cars, you are burning the gaskets of your engine. You are burning them. It's, uh, these things happen to, to all of us. None of us is excused. But friends, we were not made to worry. There was no worry in the Garden of Eden. Oh, this is part of how our lives have been distorted. And how the enemy tends to take away our focus on God, to, 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 to let God be in charge, and we want to be in charge. We want to be controlling the results and circumstances. We become control freaks. We want to control everything. There are three problems to worrying. Number one, worrying will never change your circumstances. It doesn't change. Worrying does not change your grades. Did you know that? It doesn't. Worrying does not change anything in your life. Worrying does not 
change your children. It doesn't change your wife. It doesn't change your husband. It doesn't change your political climate. It doesn't change what you are going through. This is what the Bible says. In Luke 12, I'll read from verse 21 to 26 and leave out the rest. The Bible says, Who of you by worrying can add a single hour to your life? Do you believe in the Bible? Do you really believe in the Bible you're carrying? Do you believe in the word of God? Do you believe in Jesus who said these words? Jesus said, Who of you by worrying can add a single hour to your life. In other words, worrying does not extend your life. Worrying does not extend your life, even for a single hour. Worrying does not extend your life. Since you cannot do this very little thing, why do you worry about the rest? Why? Worry doesn't provide creativity. Worry doesn't bring a change, and worry doesn't help us control the future. Worry does nothing. Nothing is nothing is pain for nothing. It's pain for nothing. Number two, worry damages your faith in God and your view of God. Worry is damaging. It damages your faith in God. Actually, our faith in God can be damaged. I've met some people who are damaged. Their view of God is damaged. They don't understand the goodness of God. They have so many questions in their lives about God. Some people actually choose to resent God. I'm a pastor. I've met some church members and I've asked them, where are you? What is happening in your life? And someone will tell you, I no longer come to church because I have problems. Can you imagine? You have problems and therefore you don't go to church. I thought that's when you needed God more. But what is happening in that environment, your view of God and the church has been damaged you. By what? By worrying. You've blown your spiritual injury. Your gaskets are leaking. Oil is coming out of the front of you. Your injury is broken. It's broken. Worrying damages your view of God. Then you can't see the kindness of God. You can't see the faithfulness of God. You can't even see what God has done in the past for you. Because you are stuck in the moment. This is who God is. This is how God works. This is God. Psalms 91 verse 45. This is God. This morning, I want us to have a new view of God, a great view of God, a beautiful view of who he is. He will cover you with his what? His feathers. Now, can you imagine the feathers of God? There must be too many. I mean, must be too many. The feathers of God must be too many. He'll cover you with his feathers. Under his wings, you'll find what? Refugee, boom, take over and hide. Winds may come, challenges may come, enemies may come, things are real, some things are not real, but he says, I'll hide you in my wings. That's the view of, that's my view of God. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampant. His faithfulness. He's a faithful God. You will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day. You will not be afraid of all those things. You will not be afraid. You will not fear the terror of night. Guys, night, the night is a terrible time. You know, do you know that many of our fears come in the night? The challenges come in the night. You go to sleep, 
you get this terrible dream. And you get this terrible dream like you are sinking in, in, in a car, in, in, you're sinking in a sea, driving your car, and your car got off the bridge, and you are sinking, and it's so real. You know, the devil can bring terrors in the night. It's like they're throwing bombs in the night over you. For some of us who have suffered from post-traumatic stress disorder and we've been in war. I mean, it's like the bombs are so real again and they are dropping on you and you, you don't have energy. You know, um, I, I, I was in war for a number of years and for, I would say, for much of my life, I struggled with post-traumatic stress disorder. Every t many, many, many nights I would go to sleep. And then night after night, I would rehearse shootings. I would rehearse roadblocks in the night because in the night, I'm trying to find an alternative to, to miss this roadblock so I can save my my life, we used to call it the Bachori. You're coming. If you're coming from Bachori, I'm sorry for you, but you remember the story for some of you who were with us during those days. They're coming and you're running throughout the night. But this time it's not real, it's just a dream. You will not fear the terror of the night. God has practically taken those things away from me, taken away. Those things away from me. Something that would happen every month actually happens like once a year. God has taken it away from me. You will not fear the terror of the night. You will not be terrorized in the night. In the night, you will not have this feeling that I can't stretch my hand. It's like something is strangling my neck. It's like my leg is falling off in the terror of the night. For the arrow that flies by day, God will protect you. This is our God. This is our God. This is the one we put our faith in. This is our view of him. But what worry does distorts your view of God, damages your view of God. Number three, worrying is harmful. And it damages you in and out. It damages your relationship with God. But it also damages your body. It's serious. It's a serious disease. It's another pandemic that is hidden. Serious. It's dangerous. It's contagious, by the way. Did you know that? It's contagious. If you start associating and sitting around people who are worried about every piece of news on TV, who are worried about every balloon flying over the country, who are worried over everything, you become like them. It's contagious. It catches us. It catches you. It catches you. It catches you. Being calm is good for our hearts. Doctors will tell you, being calm is good for our hearts. The brain and your body, we are not made to worry. It increases your stress levels and the stress is not good for you. If a, a excessive worrying and high anxiety, when it goes unresolved for a long time, it will lead you to depression. Not only depression, it can also lead you to suicidal thoughts. What is the purpose of life and living? It can even affect your body organs. Doctors are here. They can prove it for us. It can affect how you digest your food in the stomach. And then you keep going to the doctor claiming to have a stomach problem. Kumbe, you have a worry problem. You're worried. You are anxious. Therefore, you can't even digest your food. It can actually cause muscle tension. And you can spend thousands of dollars going to physiotherapists to fix your muscles. But worry is damaging your muscles as well. It can actually cause loss of short-term memory. You start forgetting. I mean, these are realities. How many of us, 
When we are in a, in a state that challenges us and problems around us, we actually forget to, turn, to take the right turn and take the right left turn. How many of us have forgotten to stop on the light when you actually have to stop and your head is just going? How many of us can actually even stop? Are you unable to stop at your gate and you end up at your neighbor? I mean, these are real things that happen among us. You are supposed to go to Nyautarama, but you are actually going to Nyanungu. It can mess us up, can cause heart attacks. This is not the will of God. And today, you are going to leave some worrisome challenges here and say goodbye to them. It doesn't mean you may never get some others in the future or stick with some, but there are some major ones to bring you right here on the cross at Carivare where Jesus Christ bred and while he was breeding, he died. And when he died, he said, it's finished. And something has to be finished here today in the name of Jesus. What do we worry about? We worry about money. Money is, I think, on the top of the things we worry about. Those who don't have money, they worry that they don't have it. Those who have some, they worry that they don't have enough. And those who do have it, they worry it's going to leave them. It's going to fly away because money has wings. We worry. We worry about our marriages. Sometimes we just can't communicate. We just can't understand each other. Your wife says so, and just one word in your mind is, is an, is, it pulls back all the history. Oh, you say something and someone misquotes you, I don't understand. You know, we worry about our marriages. We worry about our relationships. We worry about our children, don't we? We Worry. But this is what I want us to understand. It won't change your circumstances. It will damage your faith in God. It will damage your view of God. And it will affect your body in and out. It will. How do we chore it? How do we deal with it? Number one, trust in God's sovereign goodness over your world some life. Trust in your God is solving goodness over your worrisome life. God is solving. What was meant to be in a way will happen. And what was not meant to be will not happen. And sometimes we don't get that even from amazing intercessors. Even for amazing intercessors, even for people of great faith. I have seen people of great faith push their faith till they damage their faith. Have you seen that? I've seen great people of faith, intercessors, great men and women of faith, push their faith so much till they damage their faith. Because then at the end of the day, they say, where is God? Where was God? Why did this happen to me? Why did I pray and it didn't happen? Why in my family and not in his family? I love the Lord. I give. I tithe. I follow the Lord. I'm a good missionary. I'm a good person. Why? Let me tell you, the devil is not in charge. Even in Job's life, the devil was not in charge. The devil can actually put on a show. And he's good at putting on a show. Did you know that wiki people put on a show? They just put on a show and try to terrify you. They terrify you. They attack your borders. They try to terrify you. They put on a show. Even in Job's circumstances, the devil put on a show. A terrible show. But do you understand that God was working behind the scenes 
for Job. Behind the curtain, God was doing amazing things. In fact, some people think that Job's sufferings were forever. Some theologians believe that Job's sufferings were around in nine months. It wasn't that long. Trusting in God's sovereign goodness. He's a good God. He's sovereign. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 46, verse 9 to 10. Remember the former things. Those things of long ago. How far can I remember? How far can I remember the goodness of God? How far can I remember being short and uh, bullets don't get me and uh, I run away and survive and I'm here with no single broken bone. Remember the former things, the things of the old. And it says, I am God and there is no what? Other. I am God. There is no other. No, others can be there, but they are nothing. The devil is nothing. Enemies are nothing. Things that challenge us, they are nothing. Our God is bigger than our circumstances. Much, much, much bigger than what we are going through. That's why we need to have a good view of who he is. He says, I'm God and there is none like who? Like me. Even doctors are not like God. You know, some doctors can think like they are God, but they are not. Rich people can think like they are God. They are not. And they want to tell us what to do. They are not. I like what Rick Warren said in Kenya, Rwanda. Sibo mana. Sibo mana. They are not God. They are not God. Look, he says, I make known the end from where? From the beginning. He's solving. He knows the end from the beginning and you are just in the middle. And right there in the middle, he covers you with his feathers and hides you in his wings. And he says from the ancient times, what is still to do what? To come. Let me tell you. God knows if you're going to live to be a hundred. God knows if you're going to live to be 75. God knows if you're going to live to be 80. God knows. He knows. No one knows. God knows how much your life is going to be from now and next year and the following year. And he says, I say what? My purpose will do what? Well done. And I will do all that I please. The purpose of God will do what? Stand. Nothing. Not even persecution. Nothing. Not even closure. Nothing. Not even sickness. Nothing. May I make it worse? Not even your sin will stop God. Nothing. That's, 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 that's stretched. Because our God is redemptive. He is redemptive. He's a God of, not just some people call him a God of a second chance. That's a limiting God. He's always after us and he redeems us. Even your mercy will never stop him. Will never stop the purposes of God in your life. It doesn't matter how far you run away. He will always bring you back because you belong to him. Who always. And those who belong to our God, they will never go away. He's going to bring them back. God will create circumstances and situations and forces that pull them back to theirs, to God's center, to God's will, to God's purpose. You want to ask Jonah in the Bible. He will tell you. You can't run away from him. You can't. He will bring you back. You know, sometimes I meet some people who are very prayerful. Now say, what if God calls you in ministry? What will you do? 
what will you do? I mean, you're so focused on your career, on your direction. But what if God calls you <laughs> into ministry? What are you going to do? Because his purposes will do what? Will stand. Have you ever realized that some people are even, they're, they're worried that God can call them into ministry? Just worried. What if? Even parents can be worried because they know the lives of pastors. What if? What if? Number, number two. What's the cure? Follow the good shepherd. Follow the good shepherd. Follow. How do you deal with your worries? Follow the good shepherd. Psalms 23, verse 1 to 3. What does the Bible say? The Bible says, the Lord is my what? The Lord is my shepherd. Now, mark that first line. Who? The Lord is my what? Is my shepherd. He's the Lord of my life. And the Lord of my life is my shepherd. I have all I need. I'm taken care of. I have all I need in the present and in the future. I have everything I need. I am provided for in every way, right now and in the future. Now, if God came to you physically and sent an angel in your room, the angel comes in glittering like a piece of a hologram. That's in a hologram. And he comes in like a piece of a hologram, piece of light, but in a form of a human being. And God says, I have taken care of you. You'll be provided for now and in the future. Will you ever worry again? Aha. Uh -huh. Let's be careful. Will you ever worry <laughs> again? You are provided for. Listen. He says, you have all you need. He lets me. He does what? He lets me rest in green water. Pastures. I, I am rested. I am rested. It says, he leads me beside quiet, peaceful streams. I can drink. There's no turmoil in my life. He renews my strength, gives me new power, which we'll get today. He guides me along, he, along the right path, bringing honor to his name. Sometimes I prayed and said, God, I'm going to make this decision. Been struggling to make a decision. I'm going to make this decision, God. But Lord, I pray that even when I make a mistake, rescue me. I'm making the decision. I've been waiting. I'm making it. I'm pulling the trigger. God, even when I am wrong and it's a mistake, I pray the Lord, you come in and rescue me. The Lord provides. When you read that text, you'll see four things. Number one, the shepherd is a provider. Number two, the shepherd is a protector. Number three, the shepherd guides us. And number four, the shepherd corrects us. He provides food. He provides shelter. And he provides the necessities for his sheep. He does. You realize that sheep don't worry? Sheep don't get heart attacks. They don't worry. They, get, don't, they don't get strokes. They don't worry. In fact, the shepherds tend to worry more than the sheep. What does the sheep do? The sheep casts see, the worries to the shepherd. The shepherd is responsible for grass, is responsible for water, is responsible for protection, and is responsible for correcting them. The shepherd is responsible. You are his sheep. And your shepherd, the Lord Jesus Christ, is actually responsible. Let me tell you, life can be simple. Life can be simple. This is the problem. The more we get advanced, educated, and complicated, the more we actually have more worries the more life gets tiresome. I have seen basic people 
who are happy. And I don't even know where they're going to get food tomorrow. But they are happy. They are all right. When we get out of this church service, they may not even know how to get out of this place. They have no car. They have no motor money. But they are all right. They are all right. God protects, he defends us against the enemy and harm. He guides the sheep when we are confused and we don't know which way to take. And we go through those moments in life. When we are actually confused, we don't know which way should I take right now. Which way? And sometimes you pray, you fast for a week, and you hear nothing. You hear Nothing. It's like God is not saying, take this path, take this path. He said, God, I'm tired. I'm, t I'm going. Rescue me <laughs> out of these circumstances. He corrects us. Any problem that comes along, he does. God is amazing. He takes care of us. So, uh, Isaiah chapter 40, verse 11, is interesting. Talks about... Um, the shepherd again. Isaiah talks about the shepherd. And he says, he will feed his flock like a what? Like a shepherd. He will feed us. He will, he will carry the lambs in his what? Hands. Holding them close to his heart. He will gently lead the mother sheep with the young. Now, there are two important people in this verse. Two important people. We see the little lambs. And we also see the mothership. God takes care of our kids who are in nursery, who are in Sunday school over there. Some of you mothers who are seated here, you're listening to my sermon, but actually your heart is also there. It's there. That part there of that building must be the safest place on earth right now because the kids are not with you. God says, I take care of them and I bring them close to my what? To my heart. But also God says, I take care of the mothership and especially the mothers, the mothership. Mothers, you are the mothership. Mothership, God takes care of you I don't know where the men have gone. <laughs> but, but it seems many, many sometimes are not as worrisome like the mothers. When it comes, their children. So he comforts them. He says, look here. I'm taking care of the little lambs. They are going to be safe in the nursery. They are going to be safe in the incubator. They are born premature, but I'm going to keep them. And mother, don't worry. Leave it in my heart. Let, them, let me bring them close to my heart. And then you're saying, God, don't bring them close to your heart. I want to bring them close to my heart. And God says, don't bring them close to your heart. Let me bring them close to my heart. And let me bring you too close to my heart. You and the little lambs, let them come close to my heart. Because when you take the little lambs close to your heart without being close to my heart, you are going to be worried. You are going to be anxious. You can't carry this responsibility alone. God says, I want to help you. I hear God say, I want to give you peace. I want to give you sanity of mind in the moment. I want you and your little lambs next to my heart. What is the problem here? The problem is that you have not made God your shepherd. But more than making God your shepherd, you've not made him the Lord over your life. He's not the Lord over your money. He's not the Lord over your housing situation. He's not the Lord over your exams. He's not the Lord. I remember driving in Charlotte the day I defended my dissertation. 
I wish I had a driver. I was driving myself. You know, some of these things, we never really understand them. When your friend is going to, to defend a dissertation, he actually needs a driver. Because that morning, I didn't know what, is, what, is, what will be the result of my five years of work. And I'm driving in a city, I don't know, in a borrowed car. And I remember making a wrong turn, they nearly hit, they nearly hit me. So finally, I arrive on the campus. I pack up my car. I'm holding my heart. And I'm walking into this defense room to defend my dissertation. The head is running, but also the heart, something is telling me. You know, you know those doctors, they can trash your five years of work to nothing. You know, but thank God I found gracious professors. And they carried me out. And what was stressful became a great conversation. Great conversation. Let me tell you, what is the problem? We've not made the shepherd our Lord over our dissertation, over our studies, over the outcome of our labor. Whatever you are working on. On. We've not made him the CEO of our life, the boss, the driver of our car. We are still driving. He's not the driver. You know, I prefer to drive instead of someone driving me. Because I actually get more tired being driven by another person. They stop, I stop. They, they turn, I turn. Someone crosses a cross. Can we let Jesus be the driver of the car? Let him take the steering wheel and, and drive. Just Jesus be the driver of this machine. And I'm not saying a physical machine. You all know what we go through when another person is driving you, especially when they are a bad driver. By the way, they are good and bad drivers by personality. <laughs> okay? Especially when someone is a bad driver, Ooh, man, it can make your life hard. And make your life hard. You can be tired. By the time you get out of the car, you are tired. Let me tell you, many of us are tired. Because Jesus, is, we have not allowed the Lord to be in the seat. And when the Lord is in the seat, it doesn't matter what's ahead of us. If it comes down, he will take up. If it comes up, he will take it down. He has it. Away, friends, Jesus has a way of dealing with issues. Jesus has a way. The Bible says that the ways of the Lord are higher than our what? Our ways. His understanding is outstanding. How many of you have been on the wall of faith? The wall of faith. And you are on this wall. And you are hitting the wall. And you don't see how you are going to go through the wall. You don't even see a window. You don't even see a broken brick in the wall. And your faith is at the wall. I've been there when my faith is at the wall, and I didn't know. I remember when we were buying this, before we bought this property, I set my faith on another property that nearly damaged my faith. Trusting God for money, which is beautiful, great faith. But then I was not giving room to the servant of God. Because God had a much, much bigger plan. I was not praying that may the will of God be done in spite of my faith. May the will of God be done. The sovereign will of God be done in spite of my prayer. You're worried because you have a problem of control. You want to control the results. It's, all of us have that problem. The problem of control. We have it. We are control freaks. Especially on people we love. Things... <laughs> We do that. We have a sense of control. We want to be in charge. We don't want them to make a mistake. We don't. Because then we think this mistake will actually mess up their life for life. The purposes of God will stand. In spite of what is happening, they will stand. Number four. 
Make prayer a daily practice in your life. The Bible says in Psalms 55 verse 17, evening, morning, and at noon will I pray and cry aloud and he shall hear my what? My voice. Now, prayer when? The evening, prayer in the morning, and prayer at noon time. Three times a day. Maybe this is some instruction for you who is worried. Pray three times a day. Now, let me talk about prayer. You know, somehow, some of us, we've been intimidated by some prayer warriors. There are some people that have a gift from God of supplication. And when they supplicate and intercede, you think only God can hear. God can only hear their voice. He will never hear your voice. You don't know how to pray like they pray. Let me tell you, we can all pray. Prayer is for all God's children. You don't have to pray. Let me tell you, there's, there's some powerful, charismatic prayers. And when you hear them, you can't pray. You can't pray. You just can't pray because they do it. But, but this is how you pray. You wake up in the morning. If you like coffee like me, you make a cup of coffee. You sit on your chair. You open the Psalms. Psalms 25. And you see in that Psalm that he protects, he provides, he guides, and he corrects. And then he starts saying, God. Just like the one saying, God. God, I'm here. Like, like I'm praying, God, I, I, I'm lost. God, I feel like I am lost. I don't know where I'm going from. I don't know where I am coming from. Now I'm praying. God, I am like a sheep. But I know you are my what? My shepherd. God, I pray that you come and guide me. And then you finish that one, and then you pray, God, I'm insecure. I pray that you protect me. Like all these things you are thinking about. You sit down and talk to God. Not as a prayer expert. But just a, as a child of God. Child of God. You have a, you're having a conversation with God. Because what we've done actually. We've taken prayer. Out of the attitude of a conversation. And it is a rapid gun. And I, I, and I understand there's a room for the rapid gun. We call it a spiritual warfare. There's a room for that. But you know, every day is not spiritual warfare. So actually, we've made, because if every day is spiritual warfare, there's no way you're going to survive. If every day of your life is spiritual warfare, you're going to burn out. Let me tell you, you're going to burn out. Every day can't be spiritual warfare. Otherwise, then I will not understand how you live your life. We are not always fighting. There are seasons when we get attacked and we are fighting. But then there are seasons we actually have conversations with God. You listen to the psalmist. He would come in and complain and say, God, how can, how can even the unrighteous people prosper and for us we are suffering? People who don't even love you have jobs, but I don't even have a job. What is happening, God? What is happening in this city? What is happening for me? That's okay. God is okay with those kind of prayers, conversations with him. Now, the beautiful thing about it, when you start doing it, you find out it's 10 minutes, it's 30 minutes, it's an hour. You are crying tears before God. And you're not making any noise. I'm not saying it's wrong to make noise in prayer. But I just want to bring everybody in. I want to bring everybody in. The lay, the pastors, the worship leaders, the experts. Everybody 
in. In. How? When? In the evening. Gather and pray. In the morning. Gather and pray. In the noon time. Gather and pray. Walk into the sanctuary. Sit in the corner and pray. During lunchtime, I find some people praying here. Pray. The Bible says in Philippians 6, 4, 6, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, do what? Pray and do what? Make petition with thanksgiving. Present your what? Your requests to God. The message says... Don't flee or worry. Don't. Instead of worrying, do what? Pray. Press your worry with prayer. Let your petitions and praises shape your worries into what? Prayers. Didn't I tell you? They shape your worries into what? Prayers. In other words, those who worry more can pray more. Because they shape those worries into what? Into prayers. Do you have worries? Shape your worries into prayers. Turn those worries into prayer requests and conversations with God. Tell God how you feel today. Before you know, a sense of God is wholeness. Everything coming together for good will come and settle you what? Down. You'll be settled. It's a wonderful, it's wonderful, it's, it's wonderful what happens when Christ represses worry at the center of your what? Your life. So why do we worry? Because Christ is not the center of our lives. <clears throat> it's like we need to get saved again. We need to repent. It's like we have to repent of being worried. Because being worried takes Christ off the throne. So how many times do we dethrone him and enthrone worry in our lives? First Peter 5, 7 says, cast all your anxiety on who? On him because he cares for you. Everything, all, all. Don't just pray about religious things. Everything, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Cast means to unload, unload. Let it go. The Greek word literally means drop. Drop. Just drop it. I don't know if you've ever dropped something I have. I've dropped, I've ever dropped a burden. Physical one. You know those days when we were growing up, teachers would send us to go fetch water for them, those village schools. And this teacher in Lukomera sent me to fetch water for him. 20 liters on my head, walking from a very deep canyon down there to carry, you remember those things, carry water for him. I got in the middle, I got, I, it was so painful. It was a pain, and you know, we get used to pain, don't we? Especially our generation, we got used to pain. But finally I said, why carry this pain? Now you know the fear, our fear for the teachers those days. So I lifted the jerry can, pop, I hit on the ground, and instantly I was free. Instantly I was free. I didn't even go back at the school, I marched home. <laughs> I, was, I was free. You know, this is what God is asking you to do. Don't allow your oppressor, the devil, to keep oppressing you. Put down the Lord and walk home free. Free. I'm not worried about the consequences. <laughs> At least for now, I am free from pain and I can walk home. Literally, drop and a Lord. Prayer is an incredible stress reliever and a Lord. And before the last one, make long term plans but live one day at a time. You can make long-term plans. I love to dream. I love to plan the future. I can plan crazy beyond the science. Because they tell us to plan five years at a time and then add on a year. I planned 20. 
And I think over 95% of what I planned actually became a reality. Because I call it faith-informed planning. You're planning on your knees, trusting God to do it. But listen, because you plan, you make longer term plans, but don't live in the future where you're not yet. I remember a, a, a writing somewhere at a restaurant. This is the day you worried about yesterday. This is today you worried about when? Yesterday. See where you are. How many of you were worried 20 years ago about today? How many of you were worried three years ago about today? How many of you were worried 10 years ago about today? Look at you. Touch yourself. You are here. You are right. You are right. So don't open your umbrella before the rain begins to rain. So for many of us, umbrellas are open and there is no rain. It's summer. It's dry. But the umbrellas are open in case the rain rains. Many of us live that life in case something happens. In case it doesn't happen, what will you do? Today is, a, today is the tomorrow you are worried about yesterday. The Bible says, don't be anxious about tomorrow. God will take care of your what? Your tomorrow. Let's stand up on, on our feet. We're going to drop some, some worries here. We're going to drop them down. In fact, Matthew 6, 11 says, give us today our daily what? Bread. And you know, these days we have fridges. And we don't pray for the daily bread. But it's more than daily bread. It's life. Give us today our daily what? Life. Bread is life. Give us today our life. Reclaim your life back today. Reclaim your life back today. Give us today our daily bread. I want to change it. Give us today our daily what? Life. What has taken your life away? Other people would say, what is eating you? Bring it to the Lord. And if you are there and you need prayer, we want to pray for you. If there are things you want to drop, come and drop them. If this space is not enough, at least make a step into the corridor as a step of faith that I'm dropping it. Dropping it here. I'm leaving it here. I'm leaving it at the cross. And if you are there, I want to encourage you to come forward. We want to pray that those things, you have something you want to drop, some worry you want to drop, something that has been consistent on your heart, and today you want to drop it. Let's walk forward here and drop it as we worship God. Let's worship God. Let's drop it. <laughs>